But before we jump into this righteous, righteous episode with my boy Josh, let's talk about our friends over at Onnit.com, the home of total human optimization. Guys, as you know, Onnit is coming out with the best cognitive enhancing supplements in the game. They've been in this game for a long time, guys. Alpha Brain has got a free trial ready for you. All you have to do is pay shipping. Get your ass over to Onnit.com slash monkey. First, you get 10% off any and all of your Onnit supplements, and you can get a free trial of Alpha Brain if you've never tried it before. Alpha Brain is a nootropic supplement that increases the efficiency and use of acetylcholine in your brain with earth-grown motherfucking nutrients, guys. Grown from the earth. From the earth, just like all the fun plant medicines we talk about on this episode, we use those same, not the same supplements, but some shit from the earth to make your brain work better. And you can try it for just the cost of shipping. I don't know, it's like 3 or $5 or something, but it's a 10-day supply, and you can get super, super dialed in with Onnit's free trial of Alpha Brain as well as some of their awesome supplements, guys. I've really been into the Electrolyte Mix, the super bioavailable Electrolyte Mix is fucking awesome for the summer because it is hot. We're getting into triple digits here in Texas, and I've been slamming the Electrolyte Mix in the gym in my afternoon workouts when it's probably, I don't know, 300,000 degrees in the gym, and I'm just dripping everywhere, just, just slanging sweat all over the place, being completely inconsiderate, but the Electrolyte Mix keeps me hydrated so I can keep getting moist up in the gym. Guys, check it out on it.com slash real 10% off. Get after it. Dude, we are at my favorite joint in town and I'm stoked you made it finally, man. We've been talking about podcasting for like a year or something. I know. All things come in good time, man. I know, man. And and, and it actually is really well timed because what I want to ask you about first before anything else, is how was your experience down in Rhythmia? Oh, you, got, you just got into the jungle, the jungle sauce. Yeah, uh, my experience was the most life changing. I know people throw around these phrases, right? I went to a vipassana. I did a twenty x. I did some kind of fi- uh, emotional or physical crucible, but I really had uh, more introspection and, and more healing there than I think I've ever had in my whole life. Wow. Yeah. It, so it was it was truly an ego death, which I think that's the first time I experienced a real ego death because yeah. I had done ayahuasca like four different times, but this was the first time, man, that I did it four days in a row. And plus there's integration there. Like it's, it's a phenomenal experience because you don't just do the ceremonies. Uh, you go through the medicine process and the ceremonies, but then there's like teachers and healers there. You guys are talking about feelings and groups and the diet's super clean. It's absolutely incredible. So it's all, I mean, everything's there for you. Like you oh, yeah. the, the, and the, one thing that I really appreciated when I was in Peru uh, and at Spirit Quest and we had our, you know, our ayahuasca and wachuma ceremonies, it, it was that the food was provided so I didn't have to think about it. And that just that by itself changes the game. Well, there's no Whole Foods in Peru for you, man. No, dude, there's no Whole Foods. <laughs> I can't want to cruise over there and get some, <laughs> get some more organic kale. Like, that's not a thing. Yeah. But it, that having that really almost secluded experience – is incredibly impactful. I don't know what it is about that. I think it's just that you don't have there's there's limited distractions, and we are in such a distraction filled world now. If you're going to go drink the jungle sauce, that's what I, could, I, I, I that's what I call ayahuasca, by the way, uh, and other jungle drinks that are that are very potent and yes. impa- impactful. Ayahuasca is one of many jungle drinks. Yeah, the jungle sauce out there. But yeah. um, we have so many. There's so many things we can we can dive into. Yeah. But I want to hear more about ego death because that's something that I, I, every time I hear it, I do have to admit I cringe a little bit because it's like, oh, yeah, like, well, no, it's not, your ego's not gone, right? It's not yep. like you didn't murder it and like hide it in the woods somewhere. Like, what, is that, what does that mean to you? I think real ego death isn't a complete death of the entire ego. It's just the part of it that is the monkey mind that's incessant thoughts around negativity and lack of self-worth and things like that. Yeah. So the ego isn't something that needs to completely die. But let's face it, man, in our modern world, the ego is in control, I would say, for 95% of people or more. And when I say that, yeah. I mean the ego one that tells us we're not good enough, we can't accomplish our goals, who are we to be doing these uh, dream-inspiring actions like that? <laughs> and, and that happens to all of us, man. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at the work of Amy Cuddy or look at anybody that's on the bleeding edge of like human performance, and they'll tell you that part of their healing and part of their process was to turn the mirror on their ego and be like, you're not in control anymore. I'm going to take you with us. I'm going to put you in the passenger seat 
seat, but you're not at the wheel anymore. Yeah. And so I don't think we need to kill the ego completely. So maybe you're right. Maybe you caught me there on some semantics <laughs> of, of it wasn't a complete ego death. Yeah. Arrhythmia. It was more like the part of my ego that was really based in anger um, and really based in anger that I didn't even know was there. It's kind of like um, what you don't know, you don't know. And so it was an ultimate blind spot for me. Yeah. where uh, I'd gone through multiple ceremonies and on this fourth night, I had had a really bad experience. I didn't listen to the sacred si silence rule and I actually talked to some people and I think it messed me up because then after I talked to people during a ceremony, it's really important to not speak to other people. Yeah. Uh, right. Sacred, yeah. sacred silence. So, that's so a, they have, they have a, they have a framework around that. I mean, they do, they definitely talk about it, but I haven't heard it called. I've heard sacred silence in ceremonies before, but so just so everybody who's listening has an idea. So yeah. it, when you're in the, medicine when you drink when you you drink ayahuasca it's the best idea not to touch talk like connecting with other people can be a lot and for them and for you especially if you're going through a challenging experience yes and it's also like we just talked about limiting distractions extremely distracting sometimes and people will have emotional outbursts from time to time like things happen and it's that's part of the game right but the sacred silence piece is really important i like that they call it that by the way it's really important because man energetically you're so open and that's why without a guide, without a shaman, without somebody who's really protecting the space. Yeah. Uh, huge. We, how many stories have we heard recently of people, you know, pouring in a home or pouring in Peru <laughs> and then they get, um, you know, abused and it's just, it's crazy right now. It's, it's, it's honestly the wild, wild west in this psychedelic renaissance we're experiencing. Um, but anyways, back to the ego death thing. So, so I understand that now based on this experience I had in the fourth night, I really wasn't looking at things that happened before I was 10. I think a lot of people can relate to this, man. You know, yeah. before the age of 10, there's like a blank spot or if anybody has gaps of their life where there's no memories at all, neither good nor bad, it's probably because deep in the subconscious, like way down in the recesses of the mind, there's a piece of life that your subconscious is hurt from mm -hmm. and that your identity has been scarred from or stabbed from. And that was my story, man. Like I had full vision. So what, what plant medicine does and what my experience was is that, you know, that scene in Minority Report where he uses his gloves and he puts all these like um, <laughs> pictures up in front of him. It's kind of just like, like a big array of photos and memories but yeah. your, your mind will my mind connected all these memories in like five seconds and so i was standing there over the fireplace about 10 minutes before i had thrown up with snot coming out of my nose and crying so any any kind of like uh any all kind bases of, covered <laughs> <laughs> it's like i was vomiting and crying and, and then my, my nose was just running as well just yes. to, as, as an added flavor to the to the to the cocktail here any any fluid that the body could create was coming out and um I had this massive purge. Then I went over to the side of this flight deck, that, as they call it there, which is so beautiful, man. The, the moon was shining and all the stars were out. The palm trees are swinging. It's literally a postcard. It, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, it's but anyways, I'm standing by the fire. We're wearing these white shirts for the ceremony. And I just start to feel this pressure in my stomach. And I, I was going to burp. And I, I burped up this black bubble that had like film, like black tar around it. And it popped, and when it popped, that's when I saw all the photographs. Was it a real black bubble, or was it just like that was that was in your vision? I think it was a vision from my subconscious, yeah, from yeah, my, yeah. my creative that, spirit. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think there was actually a bubble. Okay, but, I was just curious. I was like, damn, if you but actually my mind, up a black bubble, that's really cool. I know that would be. <laughs> <laughs> but my mind actually saw that as true, and so yeah. I just I just visualized all this this stuff that I completely forgotten about, man. You know, yeah. like like your story, I had a lot of weight loss in in my life, and when I was a little kid, like from conception to ten, I didn't have psychological tools to deal with stress. No, and, and at that time, my mom had. Uh, a pretty severe manic bipolar disease when I was mm. zero to 10. And so it was really challenging for me to like, just deal with life. Yeah. So anyways, uh, I'm at the ceremony and I see this kid and I'm watching him, Josh Trent, little Josh yeah. getting kicked in the face, getting um, really picked on, like spit on padlocks thrown at me, just like crazy stuff, like, like kind of torture, right? And kids can be torturous. Well, I had, I had kids are brutal, man. Kids are brutal. I had, Super brutal. I had blocked all this out, Connor. I just completely blocked it out. I didn't know it was operating. And then I saw the connections between all the non-integrated pain that I had had from zero to 10 to then being a teenager, finding athletics, finding football in high school and loving the power of fitness and how that catalyzed into wellness. But then 
really what what drove me to lose the weight honestly and for a lot of men was like i just wanted to have sex i wanted to get laid yeah it's the and, same same, same and here women don't want to have sex with guys that are fat let's just be honest <laughs> yeah no it's it definitely makes it's definitely it, you know you can pull it off but it's a lot harder <laughs> totally so i connect the dots and by the way everything that we're talking about is like this happened in five seconds okay? yeah so i'm going to unroll this over the next minute or two but all this happened from like a five second snap to that, the other to, to cover that too i think there's really something funny that i've had this happen with lsd and mushrooms the most and that's that's I've I've had the most experience with mushrooms and we've talked about that's kind of my go to yeah. go to teacher plant. Um, it, is the, it's it's funny when you have all these realizations happen extremely quickly. So it's like snap, oh wow, all those things just got connected. And you they didn't seem to overlap, but then you see the chain of events and you're like, Oh, I get that now. So it's really con what you're talking about isn't isn't uncommon in any kind of in any kind of ceremonial space, yeah. or sound healing, or meditation. Like it's it's five seconds that puts together a lifetime, and it's very very wild. I think it's it's so impactful. So I'm glad that you're rolling that out. And then and then when you explain it to people, it takes like 20 or 30 minutes to get that. Totally. <laughs> you're like you don't understand. I liked how you put that, man. It's it's five seconds to unpack multiple decades of life. That's so yeah. true. That's yeah. so true. Um. So so then in this moment, I I rip my shirt off. I had burped up this bubble. I rip my shirt off, I throw my shirt in the fire, I start crying, and I put my arms in the air, and I, like no shirt on, burn my fire, sun's coming up behind me, like straight up movie scene, and I go, I'm Josh Trad. I start screaming out loud, like running around, next thing you know, I'm dancing, and it was because I had just purged, man, like I had purged a huge part of myself, <laughs> and, and that's very freeing, man, when you energetically and physiologically purge, um, there's so much healing that can happen. You know, there's so many amazing yeah. things that happen through this. And, you know, this is not for everyone, as I'm sure you've talked about in your show, man. Like this is for, as Jamie Wheel describes, 10 part of the population that should go to it on multiple occasions, 10% that should use it maybe once, and then 80% in the middle that it might not be a good fit for. Yeah. Yeah, dude. And I think that's something that really, you know, this is one of the most common things that I, I talk about whenever people ask about ayahuasca is the purge, right? I was like, oh, I don't really feel like vomiting and and it's just such a diff like the context that you have on purging on throwing up is it's completely different it's like it's a whole different game it's like football and basketball like it's like yeah when you get sick or you have food poisoning or whatever you get to those places like you're, you've patterned to believe that letting go of what's inside of you is painful and and it is, is the cause of or is the result of some bad thing that's happening to you as opposed to when you purge in an ayahuasca ceremony or in that type of medicine, it's like, thank you. Like, it's not, there's not any, it's not, it doesn't have the same emotional baggage as, yeah. as having the flu, right? Or get, like I said, food poisoning, like that's a whole different, it's a different game. And there's something about that release. I mean, when I was in Peru, I didn't have very intense visions. I got some really cool breakthroughs, little things here and there, but it was really prepping me. You could tell it was prepping me for Wachuma and Wachuma was a great experience when I was in Peru, but I, I spent like two hours wanting to get to, to purge and finally did finally did. I was one of the last people to let go and a couple of people didn't purge. And the first three nights I did ayahuasca, I didn't at all. Yeah. It was, just wasn't even in the cards. Like I kind of tried, but it was, you don't have to try, but this was, there was a part of this where I was going a big part of my uh, my teaching from that last ceremony was like, let it happen. Like I just had to sit with this like need to let it go. And it just kept holding on to it. Like my body wouldn't let it out. It was a really beautiful experience at the end. And I remember just in this purge bucket, just like, as I'm just violently <laughs> vomiting, just saying like, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. So grateful for Thank being you. able to release. And it yeah. was it was so nice. And I could kind of finally then just lay down. I mean, after that, I did that for like 30 minutes. And then I just laid down. And that was it. I was, I was, I was dumb, but it was exhausting. There's, and, there's, and it was, I was so, I felt so light after that and ready and prepared and grounded for what I was about to step into the next week. And that's really, it was, it's funny how the plants know what you need, man. And I know that sounds so woo woo and, and sure. out there, but it's especially ayahuasca knows where to meet you and what you're ready for. And sometimes you're ready for way more than you think you're ready for. And that's what people <laughs> have, you know, they have these really challenging experiences. Like I think if you have that context going in, like I truly believe that I'm ready for what I'm about to see and learn and experience that can change your frame 
right? Versus being kind of in this victim state, which I think happens a ton. Yeah. And going into ceremony too, there's not always going to be prepared. I think you and I were talking earlier today and it was like, are you ready? Are you prepared to not be prepared? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's all you need to do to prepare for a ceremony, right? And, yeah. and again, this is not for everybody, but it's like, if you have trouble in your life where you're white knuckling things, you're always trying to have control over everything. And you also feel a pull to do this type of work. It's probably the perfect time because you'll yeah. never be ready. Ayahuasca is like having a child. Okay. Yeah. Like you're you're going to go through multiple stages of like, why the hell did I do this mm -hmm. versus, oh, this is so beautiful versus I feel divine love and connected on a quantum level to all things. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're also going to go through moments of complete and total despair yeah. and pain. So I think, um, it's funny, we were in Whole Foods last night and you knocked us a uh, sandal off the counter and you said to yourself, well, how I do one thing is how I do everything. Yeah. And you went back and you picked up the sandal. And I thought, that's really cool, man, because <laughs> that, that truly is what comes up in ceremony, in these healing modalities. Like you will see all the ways that you've done those little one things all throughout your life and how they all glue together. And, yeah. and really it's the residual buildup. Like stress is cumulative, man. It is, if it you is. look at any work around behavior change or around even stress adaptation, it's the cumulative response. Paul Cech has this cool analogy in uh, Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. There's a bathtub and stress is water. And at some point, if you pour enough water, enough stress into the bathtub, it'll pour over. And that's when you have disease. And that's when you have all these deleterious health, con health conditions. And that's what happens to us, man. Eventually, we have to just empty the bathtub. Yeah. And that's what these medicines do. They're a pressure washer for our soul. <laughs> They're a pressure washer for our mind. Yeah. And honestly, I think and for some people, some people are interested in combo, which doesn't call to me, but I think all the, also Pussy. these medicines, can be, <laughs> <laughs> I think also these medicines can be uh, healing for the physical as well, man. So, yeah. Yeah. Combo is an interesting thing because they're like, well, it's not a psychedelic experience. So there's not this kind of ecstatic kind of, I don't know. Like you don't have these visions. Like I can't do combo and be like, yeah, like I've, people that listen to this show regularly know that, I've, you know, my first ayahuasca experience, I had a, I had a lioness, like attached to my neck like like biting into my neck and it was a really pleasurable and exciting experience for me and that shit doesn't happen on combo i've done combo one time and it's extremely uncomfortable and you don't get the gift of cool visions and stories it's like this is going this is good for you what do you get the gift of you get the gift of being with it like being with the uncomfortable. sounds pretty sexy connor i mean it, 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 how, how do you sell that right it's like well yeah. what do you get out of a steel fit training right like you get camaraderie and you get oh i could tell you what we get out exactly. of that exactly but it's yeah. but there's there's something about that okay i'm gonna sit with this for 20 minutes it's gonna be extremely challenging for me i'm gonna feel all the feelings i'm gonna i'm gonna not only do that but then let go i'm gonna have i'm gonna purge i'm going to respond to that appropriately my immune system's going to counterbalance that poison that I just ingested through my skin <laughs> like there's a lot that goes on there and not that I've done it a lot or that I'm very I'm very um like 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 I don't have a lot of experience with it but the people that I know that are practitioners have explained it to me in a way where I finally get it and this thing thing I get it got it for so long I'm like I don't know man you're like this frog and you put on this thing and you burn yourself and then somebody puts the frog poison on you like it's just it's a lot and you're like oh, i don't know about that and for someone who's you know again it, it scares the heebie-jeebies out of you dude i think about yeah. it it's like you're, you're actually kind of like getting toxic skin residue from a frog yes that's what but uh, that's what 5 meo dmt is as well that's true it's in that and it's they squeeze they like pop a zit on the frog and like and you, you smoke it who knew that healing could exist in all these insane places i don't right? know man it's, it's wild the things that you mentioned seal fit and like i'm compelled to tell you uh yeah what do you get from seal fit you get the fact that it's not about you explain what explain what still fit is real quick sure so we, i don't want to gloss over that it's a really cool it's a it's, really cool uh organization it is uh mark divine you know 30 year navy seal plus created seal fit uh navy seals.com anything and everything around um the seal fit way of living which you know being a seal is not for everyone but training like a seal could be and yeah. i think the thing that i got most out of the 20x which they have multiple programs they have a kokoro which danielle did that's a 40 hour crucible yeah. no sleep uh spraying spraying you with water in like 50 degree weather basically in haste basically if you guys have ever seen anything online where like seals are being tortured in their training that's <laughs> the experience for civilians like me that yeah. we went through but mine was 14 hours so the 20x is 14 hours um you are it's ours was an overnight which is rare which was even harder yeah and i get there i had my outfit everything was all set and they don't even tell you it's starting they just come up in this huge truck um all blacked out but they're, they're having so much fun 
they're having so much fun because a lot of these a lot of these guys are ex seals themselves. Yeah, of course. And so they've they've been through this. They understand. But right from the beginning, my ego was tested. Yeah. And it's funny because in the beginning of this, we were like, "Oh, ego death? What is that all about? Do you want to really kill the ego? Yeah, you want to kill the parts of it that tell you you should be selfish and that you're not good enough because that ex that message is coming from the same place, that same place of lack. So what yeah. you get in seal fit is you get this understanding by taking the physical body to a place where you have to depend on other human beings. You cannot do it alone. Mm. That's the gift of seal fit. It's this crucible where it's not about you. And if you make it about you, the instructors have this kind of scent sniffing mechanism where if they see you making it about you, there's actually a moment where um, I dropped a sandbag. <laughs> and we did this documentary, this eight minute documentary about the experience. And the instructor saw me drop the sandbag and he's like, Trent, you fucked up. Everybody drop down and do 30 push-ups because your teammate only cares about himself. And that was in like the first hour. It was insane. And then from there on, because I made that one mistake, they kept their eyes on me the entire rest of the 13 hours. Yeah. Kind of like when you're in football. Well, the coach like, knows like you really mess up. similar to football, yeah. <laughs> so by the end of it, man, I was in tears. And in the video we produced, um, at the very end of the video, um, my buddy Josh, the videographer who made it, he was like, what'd you learn the most? And I was like, I'm so grateful to know that when it really comes to achieving something for the greater good, it's way bigger than me. It's not about me. Yeah. And so that's the kind of, of positive ego death that I think physical crucibles like the 20X can bring similar to medicine, man. Yeah. And it's all very, it's all very similar. As weird as it seems, like it's very, very similar when you, it's, it's, and I really feel like the, the, the kind of overlapping component is connection. Really. You know, if you think about that through, that's why, that's why sports like football, man, football is not healthy for people. It's essentially your modern day gladiators and we are sacrificing people for the game. It's when men go for, to war together. Exactly. But it's like, it's the closest thing we've got right now, right? Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. Navy SEALs, like camaraderie and that. And any, I, don't just, I use football as, as because the sacrifices are so clear and dramatic, but so softball teams, volleyball teams, water yeah. polo teams, Olympic bobsledders, like this, there's something about like that whole, that whole connection piece that just gets people fired up. And if you look at like what are the most popular things in the world, it's either something that involves people being connected or a surrogate for connection, which is like when that's when you have like these these drug epidemics, right? Like opioids. Yeah. And and if you think about people describe heroin as as being like get, like running into your mother's arms is what it feels like. That sounds and when scary you as think shit. Think of that. You're like, oh, it makes sense now. Yeah. Because this is a this, this is a, a, a like a lost soul in a way that's fucking that's what they 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 don't have that feeling anywhere else, and once you have it, like how are you gonna let that go, right? It's like it's like being put like I think if after having that as a, and I've, I watched um, The Wire, one of the best shows I've ever ever created, fantastic show, and you when you start to develop an understanding of how that world works, you're like fuck, man, this is wild. But so you look at that and it's like okay, so connection, an understanding of what connection can do and how bringing awareness to that can lead to a lot of changes in your life and can lead to a lot more fulfillment in the actions that you take because if you have that understanding introvert extrovert black white asian doesn't matter like there's something we're all human beings right and there's something about feeling connected to your community feeling connected to the work you do feeling connected to yourself first that really makes a huge difference. And that's why I think Ooh. seal fit and ayahuasca and these other things are very similar. And a lot of the time is there, there is this challenging experience involved with it. Yeah. All right. And the metaphor too, man, is that what we're really talking about here is freeing the hungry ghost. Yeah. Gabor Mate talks about like the hungry ghost inside of us. And there's like millions of views on his video that he references. Gabor Mate is, is He is incredible. so incredible. He's actually, he's on the board at Rhythmia. Yeah. So anyways. I met, I met him one time and he's a super chill guy. And he's in his 70s, but yet he has such a young spirit, but he's so wise at the same time. He's kind of got the whole thing going on. He's, he's, yeah. he's got the package. But too. he also, he got that through some really traumatic experiences in his life right. pre-birth. Well, this, this is what, this is the archetype of the wounded healer becoming the healer. I mean, yeah. that's, that's a very valid. That's a very valid archetype. You know where the, the, the wounds are where the light shines through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get cracks, man. You get cracks, and then yeah. that's how the light gets in. So, you know, thinking about this this motif or this metaphor of like the wounded healer, um, the way that all of us are continually healing ourselves 
it also doesn't have to be so like esoteric and so crazy. Like there is a way to describe this. Like yeah. look at this fun conversation we're having right now. It doesn't have to be so serious, man. Our yeah. healing work can have moments of seriousness and maybe weeks or whatever it is, but we don't need to be these people that are constantly in a healing phase. Like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm releasing right now. I'm letting go. And we see this right now with the industry that's popping up, which is coaches, coaching coaches to be coaches. Oh my God, dude. I feel like I, when I was in Encinitas, which is where you live, so oh, yeah. outside of San Diego, I was, I was kind of watching this and observing it. It's something I'm, I'm, I'm hypercritical a lot of times. Uh, I'm like they call it. If you look different, strength finders that that thing that you have to do for work usually. Yes. But it's it's restorative, right? So which is essentially saying like you're very critical. And I love in a, as an, I'm an ENTP on the Myers Briggs. If you're into that world, so it's I'm the debater, right? I just lo I love you know. And somebody said this on um, Malcolm Gladwell's podcast the other yeah. day. I love intellectual disagreements without taking it personally. Like I just get off on it. But most people can't do that. Like I'm not necessarily attached to my ideas, but I like to argue an idea just for the sake of arguing it. Yes. And I observe. I'm very observant, and I like to sit back and watch what's happening, and then and then comment on it. I should probably be some kind of commentator in some <laughs> in some way. But I remember in Intonitas, it's the funniest thing. I was like, it feels like everybody in this community, like it's like the money is just going in circles because someone's hiring someone else to coach them on something else, and then that person's hiring this other person who's coaching them on something else. And if you go long enough, it's like the person at the end of that line is hiring the first person to coach them on something else. And then they're all just validating each other's ideas in a circle, and they kind of spiraled out of their fucking minds. I was like, they were talking about stuff, and I'm like, you, you were not steeped in reality by any <laughs> like have you been to the, have you been outside of here it's like yes. it's like it's like it's like lord of the flies like it's like oh it's what happened to you guys you were describing <laughs> the one of the biggest things that triggers me the most and that is people being sold this fallacy that they are a healer that gets to have their voice and gets to have their community and gets to have all these things it's like no that's that's not not everybody gets to have what their biggest, most insane, ludicrous dream actually yeah. is. And that's part of life, man. Yeah. Like, like, we don't all get to have exactly what we want. But as the song says, we will get what we need. Like, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all going to get what we need, right? I love that you're saying that, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. like, what, what, what do we really need in this life? We really need love and connection. And, and I want to circle back, bro, because this, this phrase that came up from the Hungry Ghosts, one thing that Gabor talked about is the opposite of addiction is human connection. Oh yeah. And you had mentioned that it's like, it's really, what do we all need? It's connection. What are we missing the most? What's driving the opioid epidemic? It's a lack of connection. Yeah. It's been cool as hell just to connect with you and all these awesome people. Yeah. And it's been something that I, honestly, man, like, like totally vulnerably, like I work a lot from home. And so this has been so refreshing to my soul. Yeah. You know, and I felt parts of me come alive here that for the past month or two have been kind of dormant in San Diego. Well, it's That's funny. Real. I think there's something to, I appreciate that, man. And I noticed that as well in you and just being around you the past couple of days. And that's honestly like we're, we're so right now we're recording the show at cosmic coffee and beer here in, here in Austin, Texas. And it's like, is the sound quality the best? No, it's not. It's, we're not in a studio, but we're, and this is something I love to understand, like we're immersed in connection of other people that are doing work, smiling at each other, engaging. And like, there's something about even the podcast that come out of environments like this that are different, that I yeah. like more. And that's why I do it. That's why I do it. I could definitely go, we could definitely be in my, in, in a room in my house right now doing this in complete silence, but it just doesn't have the same feel to it because I think connection is so important because essentially we're connecting over this conversation and because technology is what it is, people are connecting with this conversation. And that's really, really intense and really fun to think about, even though it's not, I'm not Joe Rogan, you know, we're not out there doing the thing. It's like thousands of people will hear this. That's really cool. And, that, and there's a, there's a place of, of creating, sh creating and sharing connection that is extremely powerful to me. Dude, like, this there's, is, there's something about it that really fires me up. This is why I started my podcast in 2015, because I had experienced enough pain and enough lack of connection yeah. with myself and with other people that I had to do the podcast. It was like no choice because I'm, I've always been one of these people since I was a little kid that like, I always wondered why people didn't treat each other with love. I always wondered why yeah. I felt things deeper than other people. Now I know that I'm more empathic than most, Yeah, uh, which I think you are as well. Like I you am. feel people's emotions, right? <laughs> so for you and I, it's funny because I say that I didn't know what empathy meant like four years ago. Okay. My, Mike Bledsoe explained to me what empathy was. So yes. I know it's probably five years ago now. So for you and I, it's really important to have a healthy filter where we don't take on other people's emotions. You mean boundaries? Not he <laughs> healthy boundaries, man. Yeah. So, so I'm looking back at my life as a kid and I'm like, oh, that's why I always cared more than most people. Mm -hmm. And I think the podcast came through because there was a huge part of me that if I didn't speak my truth, if I didn't open up my throat and my chakras and just be like, this is who I am, this is what I stand for, yeah. I think a big part of me would have died. 
a big part of me would have died. Yeah, I mean, it'll lay dormant for sure your whole life. It's wild. But it's going to be there. And for yeah. some people, it just it has to come out. It has to come out, man. Well, that's what's funny about, like, so uh, a good friend and, and friend of the podcast, Kirsten Asher and I are running this retreat, right? We get to, it, it's, We're creating a space for exactly that. And yeah. it's really fun to think about that. Like, I'm going to go to this retreat. You're going you to come down for I'm it. I'm going. Man. It'll be fun. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's just letting it all go and, and being your full authentic self and just even though it's, it's you're not going to be able to take that whole experience that whole raw freedom of expression out of the weekend completely and d- you shouldn't go to the office with that same mentality and start ecstatic dancing in the middle of your workplace probably maybe, Which would be kind of fun where you work. it would break up the sales meeting it would definitely be it would be fun yeah it would be fun once i think after that people would get <laughs> but um but there's something about that it a mind, what is it? A mind once expanded by a new idea never regains its, its original dimensions, right? So once you've expanded your context on what expression can be, we get to take that expansion into the rest of your life and just have you have more context on what can be. And I think experiences like you coming to Austin and meeting all these people and me going to San Diego and doing the same, like you get these really incredible opportunities to expand what your reality is, essentially, and how you view the world. Super fucking powerful. Well, yesterday, man, I was at the Michael Pollan event in a church, by the way, which is so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, have you read his book yet? Or are you going to read not, it? It's next. Okay. So um, he's exploring the healing power of psychedelics. And yeah, that book talk- is called How to Change Your Mind. How to Change Your Mind, yeah. um, How Psychedelics Can Heal. And, There'll and be a link in, link in the description. Okay. And uh, this guy is amazing. He's a food writer, but now he's some, for some reason, was inspired to write about psychedelics based on his own healing. And so in, we're in a church here in Austin at the Central Presbyterian Church. And I'm thinking, oh my God, part of what Jamie Wheel talks about is that for so many millennials, the leaders of religious doctrines always wanted to push down uh, yeah. psilocybin or any kind of plants that could connect people, which is really a gateway to God. Yeah. And so we're, here we are in this incredible time to be alive, Connor. Like I was in a church where typically <laughs> for millennia, these tools were pushed yeah. down as conversations with God. But there we were in a church talking about conversations with God through these plants, which is really just the connection to God is actually the connection within ourselves. That's where all the healing comes from. 100% agree with you there. Have you had an experience where you felt like you were communicating with a God or like a God figure? In, 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 in yeah. I will say in psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was a, there was a moment where I looked across the courtyard uh, in Costa Rica and I felt my grandpa's presence more than I had ever felt in my life when he was here, when he was actually yeah. physically here. And he put his arm out to me and, and I also felt the presence of ayahuasca on my left shoulder. And I had just had snot throw up in tears coming out <laughs> and I screamed and ayahuasca was like, are you listening? Are you listening? <laughs> but not in a hurtful way, but just in like a stern motherly voice. <laughs> and I knew what she was meaning. Like, are you listening to the love of your grandfather? And I was like, oh. you know, and I, and I really felt his presence there. And he, and he said, I knew that you would take care of my little girl when I died. I knew that you and your brother would, would take care of your mom. Wow. Yeah. And I, and I just, and, and she said, are you listening? And I was like, oh, am I listening to the fact that the only thing there is in this world is love? Yeah. Yeah, I'm listening to that. Yeah. You know, and I'm kind of like even feeling it right now because that that is the truth and it's a platitude that Michael Pollan talks about. Sometimes these platitudes like they're the only thing there is in the world is love, they're so true, but they're so overstated that the truth kind of bleeds out of them. But yet it doesn't change the fact that they're true universally for all human beings yeah just because they're a platitude doesn't mean they lose any more impact or truth i think that's i think there's something to be said for that as well and and we and we resort back to them because they are true when you have those experiences and and you and you've said it and you've heard it but then you feel it and you're like oh no no this thing and everybody everybody else has already heard the words i think people have cried wolf right yeah and it doesn't have the same impact you're like no but you haven't felt that thing you haven't felt that you're connected to everything it's a lot and it's, it's amazing but if I say it to somebody who hasn't felt it, it's just fucking words. Well, it also could, it could turn them off too. Exactly. This is something that you and I mentioned earlier. It's like we get to combine the practical and the spiritual now. It's 2018, baby. <laughs> like, I know, dude. There's like, no, I, we there's, get to combine those two. It's funny that you say that because ayahuasca, ayahuasca told me yeah. uh, when I first experienced this. I don't remember which one it was. One of the first three was she goes, you're not supposed to take this too seriously. And I was like. Yes, I have permission to fucking make, make ayahuasca jokes as much as I want <laughs> and make fun of some of this shit because at the end of the day, like, there's a place for that. Yeah. There's a place for that. And, and, and I saw that. It was like there's th- – listen, man, you can float around in your robes and, 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 and namaste people all the fuck you want. That is not the way – that's not my medicine for the world. 
it's not gonna. It's, I have no intention to be that. I, I what do you remember? Um, Billy Madison, mm -hmm. you know, Happy Gilmore when he goes to yes. play golf and, yes. and and Chubbs comments on his outfit. He goes, if I dress like that, I'd kick my own ass. That's how I feel about some of these fucking gurus out there, totally. and these life coaches. I'm like, man, if I acted like that, if I had an Instagram ad that said that, I would kick myself in the dick. I'd find out a way to do it. <laughs> this is and what I like, feel like in Encinitas, man. Sometimes it is, man. Yeah. Encinitas is a challenging place. I've actually brought that up more than a few times in this show. And it's funny because there's there, this, like even, so I have a lifestyle design practice, right? I come out and say, I am not a fucking coach. Don't call me a coach. I'm not a co I'm not coaching you. We're ha I create a space where you can have an extremely transparent conversation, and I have a lot of access to resources and practices and exercises that can help you get through that yourself. I'm a teacher, maybe. Mm -hmm. Coach, not a chance. I'm not sending you a fucking PDF. There's no checklist. Like, we'll, we're, you're going to get out of this what you put into it because six weeks committed to anything that you've paid for especially will make a big difference. And if you resonate with the message of this show, then it makes a lot of sense for that person to be me that's guiding you through that. And I'm super fucking stoked to do it. But I'm not Lewis Howes, and I'm not Ty fucking Lopez either. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to have a good time. We'll probably end up being friends at the end of this thing. And it's fun. It's, yeah. it's a fun way to, to take actionable steps and clear the fucking noise in your life because we're so distracted all the time. Well, think so about like, this, man. We're on the realness, right? So the realness factor of this is that I believe that the coaching model is dead. Oh, dude, it's, 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 it's dead. The, everyone's it, a fucking coach. What now. you're describing is actually a guided experience from knowing to doing. Yeah. And there's a bridge in between or A to B, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Right. You're, but, but coaches, if you think about the word coach, traditionally they would take somebody, their responsibility as the coach is to take that person from one place to another. It's not your responsibility to take yeah. someone from one place to another. It's your experience and it's your love to guide them from one place to another. Exactly. And then of course, with that comes your own experience, your own tools and, and the value you bring to them. Yeah. But the coaching model, unless you're in an athletic world, it's dying. And it's dying really fast. Well, that's the thing. I was a coach for a long time. I mean, I coached from – shit, I've been a coach. I've been a coach or a teacher in some some faculty for like the longest time. Like, so I was probably seventh grade. I started coaching a little league baseball, right, And uh, for like young kids. And from there, like, that's the thing. Like, okay, so say you're doing we're – we're doing CrossFit and you're doing snatch and clean and jerk or learning how to do butterfly pull-ups. The – I, then I have the answers for you. Most of the, I have more answers than you have. I can say no, no, no. When you do this, hold your legs this way. When you're doing your, when you're doing your gymnastics, like lock down this. And I'm, and I'm, t I'm literally touching you and telling you how to, where to put your body and how to do it in space. Versus when I'm working with somebody through lifestyle design, it's like asking really fucking good questions. If you're trying to learn how to snatch more weight, and I'm like, I don't know, what do you think? And then people are like, fuck, I don't know, man. You're the, you know what the hell you're talking about, not me. But I believe that everybody has all the answers they need inside of them. They yep. just have to broaden their perspective or maybe take a step step over it and look, look at it from a different angle. And then you're like, oh, I never noticed that thing before that was right in front of my face. And I think a lot of that comes with what we're talking about to bring it all the way back around to ego death is, is the ego death is understanding that you're fucking wrong sometimes. And being okay with that and being grateful for yeah, but being wrong Yeah, that shit's hard to swallow, man. Because oh, it like, is. swallowing the fact that you made a mistake or that you were full of yourself or that you were actually wrong. And in that moment when you did the thing that's causing you the pain, it actually came from a place that you're not even connected to. Mm -hmm. But yet it's still happening. And this is what's going on with the deeper subconscious, man. 90 freaking percent plus, Connor, the more research that comes out. Yeah. 90 percent of everything we do, man, it's in that subconscious mind. So how, oh, do we, how do we get into the subconscious, right? Yeah. We design a life where we have exploratory practices to go in there and clean out the shit that's not serving. Mm -hmm. And letting go is huge. I mean, I wrote, I wrote an article about this, but it's like letting go is so challenging. It's like ripping your fucking fingers off sometimes. And it's not generally letting go of the stuff that, that you don't like. Like sometimes you identify with something and it, you create your identity around it and you don't like it and you have to do that work to let that go. But when you do let it go, it's almost like immediate liberation feeling, right? Like a little, it's, li it's lighter feeling. It's letting go of the shit that you like but you don't like enough for what you're putting into it and it's not fueling you. Mm. That's really fucking hard because that probably was awesome at one point and now it's no longer awesome. And I'm talking about friendships, relationships, things you do with your time. Like getting fucking relentless with that is no joke, dude. It's no joke and it's challenging as fuck, but that's the, once you get past the low hanging fruit of like, well, I don't like doing that. Wow, I brought awareness to the fact that I don't like doing that shit and I'm gonna stop doing it. Cool, that's, that's step one. Now you're move, you've, now you started to push the boulder down the mountain and yeah. then you go, okay, oh shit. I do like that thing, but I have to be really, really conscious of 
how much energy it takes versus how much it gives and what am I, why am I, why do I like it? Where is that coming from? And being yeah. very inquisitive of yourself. And I even say like being inquisitive, self-inquisitive is, is actually more powerful than being self-critical because you end up in this place of like, fuck, I suck. And you're just putting yourself back in that egoic thought cycle of how, how good you aren't. And, <laughs> and you get fucking caught up. And that's at the place of, that's literally a place of distraction. That's somebody like, dangling a shiny thing over here. Like, oh, remember you're not good enough. Remember you're not good enough. All yeah. it, and, then, and then that keeps you from fucking going anywhere. Because you're like, oh, yeah, well, that's right. I can't re- do this thing. What really comes up for me, bro, in, in hearing this, this way you shared right now, which is so powerful, it's like an inventory process. There's a fucking inventory process where you actually look within, whether it's through a journal or yeah. a text edit notepad open like going through somewhat of an inventory you will gather evidence and this is something that's come up so strong for me lately it's like (laughs) can we can we just gather the evidence that is aligned with who we truly believe we are yeah i'm gonna say that again like when you wake up in the morning when you go throughout your day like are you committed to taking loving ownership of your experience and gathering the fucking evidence that shows you you're loved you're supported and that you're living life on the right path yeah. Are you committed to gathering that evidence? And so I, the phrase came through for me in a meditation actually before I came to Austin and I was like, oh, I'm going to double down. I'm going to recommit to gathering the evidence <laughs> that people, people enjoy my experience. They enjoy being around me. I'm loved. I'm supported and I'm living my life on the right path. And like that can't be faked yeah. because, but, but here's the big kicker. It's like we have so many things that block people from taking that initial emotional inventory from from gathering the evidence Mm. that they're loved and supported and living life on the right path that they become so distracted that they lose touch with the fact that the power is always there to gather that evidence the power is always there to be in that alignment with the inventory and i think the reason is because we're in this crazy time right now connor where technology has dampened people's intuitive ability to connect with themselves it's a real fucking issue it's actually more of an issue i think than opioids than drugs and all of that because it really stems from this lack of human connection which as you talked about comes from a lack of connection within us yeah we're not taking the inventory yeah, there's something to be said for that for sure. And technology is interesting because it, it's like it's like food. It's, it's, that's why that's why food is such an issue, right? Because we have to have it. We have it all the time. It's around. Yeah, you got to eat. Like you're not, unless you're unless you're going unplug. I mean, you, you can't get away from food. But if you say just like I'm gonna go off grid and get rid of everything, <laughs> it's like no. And then it's funny because if, in the world that we live in, where it's like, oh no, my my value in the podcast sphere is literally quantifiable. How many like downloads I, you got? How many yeah. downloads you got? Dude, when someone asks yeah. me that straight off the bat, I'm like, yo, oh, fuck yourself. Yeah. Okay, you, you, so if you gonna, ask me that in the first two minutes of us hanging out, yeah. we're probably not going to be that close. Somebody hit me up the other day was like, hey, how many downloads do you get on your podcast per week? I have somebody I want to introduce you to. I'm like, and I said, my response was, me liking them has more of a, is more of a factor in them getting on my show than my downloads. <laughs> you know what I've said to people? <laughs> I, I've been like, hey, no problem. I'll email you back. Um, just let me know real quick. How much money do you have in your bank account? <laughs> It's the same thing. But it's funny, yeah. It's, it's a weird, it's a, it's a funny thing. I'm like, yeah. all right. I mean, I get, there's a place to be asked that, but it's like that's not the starting place. Not when we just it's like meet. it's like meeting a girl and be like, so you want to fuck or what? It's like <laughs> what, huh? Nice shoes, want to fuck? <laughs> it's such it, a, such a weird thing. I know, I know. But so, so coming back around to this though, and we've we've circled the ego a lot. Yeah, I want the ask, ego is dancing. It's yeah. just like he wants us to. It's trying to distract us with talking about fucking already. I saw it. I felt it coming up. <laughs> uh, no, but um. What what are some things? And this is this is something that Mike Bledsoe, a good friend of uh, both of ours, you're yeah. friends with Mike, right? Yeah. Um, he asked me the other day. I, we were I was you know going through some really intense letting go of shit. If you if you follow what I do, like it's come up. Like my podcast goes in themes based on what I'm dealing with, which is it's very genuine. <laughs> and sometimes it's a couple of weeks behind, so I listen to my shows. I'm like, man, I was really in the middle of some shit there. Uh, but I've been letting go of some stuff that's been really challenging. That's where that whole idea of letting go of what you like but don't like enough came yeah. from. And Mike asked me a really powerful question. We were out to dinner one night talking about some things. And he goes, what do you need to be right about? Like, what is it that you really need to be right about in this whole situation that you're in? Because you, you want to be right about something. And I was like, holy shit, I do want to be right. I want to be right about what this meant. I want to be right about, about the goodness of people and the intentions of people. And that I can, I want to be right about the fact that I intend, that I, I'm intuitive enough to know what the fuck people are going to do, like that I that I didn't get made a fool of. I don't, you know what I mean? It's all these things came up, and I was like, holy shit! And then the biggest thing was, and I wrote this recently as well. It's like, oh, I was wrong. I was just wrong. I was wrong. Fuck. Okay. Well, shit. I was wrong. Here we go. You know? And there's something about that where it's like, good. 
right? Then when I changed the name of the podcast, like there was some things that I, I looked at and I was looking at the, I like get to take a, I was sort of working with Dan Houston from Mind Tribes and I was like, we had gone through some stuff and I got to look at the whole thing and be like, okay, statement number one, this isn't working. Parts of it are working. The content's fucking great. The community is awesome, but I'm not able to participate in life the way that I want to right now. So something's not working. I've got to let go of some shit. And dude, that spun me out into some like the last two months of just like being really, really relentless with that. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say and ask you the question, what are some things that you feel like you've been wrong about and had to grit and just accept the fact that you were wrong about them? Wow. Uh, I've been wrong about a lot of shit. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> Welcome to being a human. I, I definitely was wrong. I think in my early 30s, I was like, okay, by the time I'm, I'm 34, 35, I will have a marriage, I will have a house, and she'll probably be pregnant. I've definitely been wrong about that, okay? <laughs> um, but, but because uh, I think that was probably the biggest one that I've been wrong about, and I think I beat myself up about being wrong for a long time. Yeah. And what really allowed me to let go of that was just that I got a greater intuition about myself and what was really important to me. And, yeah. what, and what was really important to me was uh, speaking my truth and having the courage to do that and building the internal resilience to no matter what environment I'm in, no matter who I'm interviewing, no matter where I'm speaking or what I'm doing, can I just be honest? Yeah. Can I just tell the truth? And I think I've always felt intuitively within myself that I'm kind of a late bloomer. Like uh, a lot of my friends, most of my friends actually are married and they're kind of like on their path and they have a line that they're already carving out, you know, kids and the white picket fence and the mm -hmm. boat and the dog. Um, and so for me, it's been a longer process of discovery around like, what is my truth and do I have the courage to speak it? And so yeah. now that I'm in this work and I feel like that's what I'm fortifying, something else that came up for me where I realized I was wrong is that in relationships, when I was getting feedback from my partner, especially my last relationship, I realized that I just wanted to be in a space where there wasn't conflict. And if I could just make a joke or like not really deal with what was really going on, like my deepest, darkest feelings, if I could just be right about my ability to control the fact that I could diffuse a conflict, well, then I wouldn't actually have to deal with what the conflict was in the first place. Mm. And that for me was big in a relationship, my past relationship, because I realized, damn, you're really sensitive, bro. You're sensitive to the feminine's feedback. Yeah. And when I looked into what that really was, it was because when I was a kid, I saw my mom go through two failed marriages, my dad go through two failed marriages back to back. And I noticed that what was the one thing that was happening in my parental experiences of their marriages failing? Ah, it was constant nitpicking and conflict. Mm -hmm. So in my adult life, I veered away from conflict with the feminine, which is a healthy, natural process of being in relationships. It served you at one point. Yeah. It served me at yeah. one point. So when I look back, those are the two big things, man. I wanted to be like at a certain age, having this certain experience. Otherwise, nothing was <laughs> the way it was supposed to be, which I was totally wrong about. Yeah. And then the second one, the big one, is that... Ah, there gets to be healthy conflict in relationships and I don't get to be so sensitive. I get to be more curious about why the conflict is there. Think about what data talks about in this work, right? Yeah. It's like the feminine is going to push you to your edge, but it's your responsibility as a masculine and a conscious male to not go beyond your edge. Yeah. So it's, it's for me, oh, as, I soon as, lost I would, that shit recently. Yeah, as soon yeah. as I would feel the edge <laughs> coming up with the feminine and conflict, yeah. I would pull back so hard because it would remind me, it would remind me of the imprinting that I received from my adolescence and childhood seeing, oh, well, if conflict and nitpicking and arguing and, and negativity between a, a mom and a dad makes the marriage fail, well, then I'm not going to do any of that shit. Yeah. The minute I sniff out any conflict or the minute I experience any dissension in conversation, I'm just going to make a joke or like kind of go around it. And that actually just perpetuates the conflict itself. Oh, yeah. And so I'll raise my hand and the white flag at the same time and be like, uh, whoever my beautiful queen is that's on her way to me right now, because I'm calling that in, yeah. I'm so ready to drop deep with you into conflict into the darkness, into whatever we need to do. Cause I know that the more we explore that space, man, the more joy and ecstasy and love and connection we're going to have on the other side. And that's really what this is all about. That's huge, man. That's great. Well, it's well said. You know, it's, it's funny you say that some stuff, something came up for me right there where it was, um, JP Sears talks about this and JP and I have kind of inverse, inverse paths as getting where we are. Like he took himself way too seriously for way too long. And I didn't take myself serious enough for the longest time, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which is a way in way of both of our kind of our the way we participate in the world now is very funny because it's very similar, but it's like, Oh no, you went the opposite. Like I, I was avoiding myself by not taking myself seriously and you were avoiding your true self by t 
taking yourself too seriously and trying to be like Eckhart Tolle. Yes. And you couldn't be funny and I couldn't be serious. It was, fun, <laughs> it was a very funny thing. We had this conversation. Yeah. And he talked about um, anger. And in this pre- a previous relationship of his, uh, he, had, he had realized that he was putting anger away because it didn't fit the identity that he believed he had. So he didn't want to be angry because he was a spiritual dude. He was woke. He yeah. was an energetic healer, right? He's done a lot of really impactful work. People don't think about that because he's like the satirical you know, spiritual as fuck guy, but he's got, he's got real, real chops when it comes to working with people and, and doing healing work. And he put anger away for that. And when he said that dude on this, on this, uh, in his premium as fuck community, I was like a premium AF, he calls it, but I go, we're explicit here. We know what AF means. Yeah. Um, yeah. I look at that and I was like, holy shit, I'm doing that right now. And the funny thing is when I let go of that and I was like, man, I've been, I've been hiding anger away deep inside of me and pretending like it doesn't exist and hiding behind laughs and jokes and whatever and kind of self-deprecating. I was fucking mad. And I did a mushroom, a really deep mushroom ceremony right after that. And dude, the darkness that came, like, that poured out of me that needed to come out. Like I was fully embodied by my shadow. It was like, oh, hey, here's all this stuff. Dude, I was, I was literally just sitting in that anger for probably a month. Like just being, just allowing myself to feel and experience yeah. frustration and anger that I'd hid, hidden away. And it's like that, for me, it was like, since I knew what was going on, I could be with it and kind of, and kind of navigate it well, because I knew it needed to happen. But fuck, man, when you start hiding that stuff away, and if it comes out in a, in a place that's not appropriate, that's what starts happening. That's toxic masculinity, in my opinion. It's opinion is like you're hiding the stuff away, and then it comes out in these really unhealthy ways. Dude, I got to say this. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Terminator, he said something powerful that relates to what you're talking about. Anger is more powerful than despair. Anger is more powerful than despair. So on the line of emotions, you can't just snap your fingers and go from like complete and total despair to ultimate happiness. No, there's an emotional progression. There are stairs emotionally that you climb. So when you're angry and you're allowing yourself to feel your anger, how healthy is that? How healthy is that? But yet with all this positivity and good vibes only and bullshit memes that we see all over social, how dampened is, especially in the masculine, our ability to connect with our primal rage and anger. And this this is why I think the physical training is so important. Oh, yeah. How are we to be in touch with our anger and with our most raw primal self if we're not maxing out our physical capability from time to time? It's an art form that's being lost in the world. (laughs) And this is why I'm stoked for Jordan Peterson. I'm stoked, honestly, for you, man. I'm I'm stoked for a lot of the guys here in Austin that are are really giving the masculine a conscious voice that's based in primal power, but also like emotional intelligence, right? We can can do both, man. We can have the show sword and the shield and we can also have the book and, and the mind i used to say um i still say this all the time is that you can have feelings and not be a little bitch <laughs> those things aren't mutually exclusive right it's like that's you, true, you can true. have you can have it's like what you've been told your whole life like then you can't cry and don't yeah. be a pussy right like that's, and that's really like growing up in small town texas that's how it goes and dude it's been really fun and it's been fun watching you develop it i mean we've met, it was two years ago we met two years ago yeah. paleo effects yeah. Paleo effects man brings people well, together you, you were a different person when i met you you seem like way less grounded then. You seem very grounded now compared to back then. Yeah, man. I was well, I was uh, when I met you. I you're kind of like all over the place. A little bit all over the place. Yeah, yeah. which which was a, which was a really important part of my life. I think I can't remember. They all kind of run together, but um, I was maybe going to move to New Zealand. No, 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 no. That was the year after. So I was. I, this is when I was at on it. Yeah. So there was a lot going on. I, a lot of identity crisis there, man. There was a lot of stuff that I was. I was kind of shook, to be honest with you, in that place. I've gone through so many identity yeah. thresholds. And I think when I met you, I'd actually taken too much LSD on oh, accident. Okay. Okay. That's <laughs> so honest. That may have been. So Kyle, um, we were gonna microdose, and he accidentally gave me two drops instead of one. So microdose is like a little heavier micro. So I ended up doing like a. a Three quarters of a hit of acid on accident. I've never done it before, and I think I met you that day. Woo! Yeah, so <laughs> that explains the ungroundedness. <laughs> yeah. So it was like I just was like, um, I'm just trying to just trying to exist. I actually made some really great partnerships with people like Sean Amata and these awesome people. But anyways, that's the a little bit of vulnerability. Uh, and then ever, at last last Halo effects, there were a lot of people that were doing LSD. Then was a year later, it's like, nope, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. This, this exploratory states like yeah. the microdosing path, it's not for everyone. And I also think that uh, even if you look at Jamie's hedonic calendar, there's a way to do this where yeah. you're not just doing it yeah, Jamie hap- Will's great. haphazardly. Like you don't want to experiment with this stuff no. haphazard- haphazardly. No, man. It'll actually mess you up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I appreciate you noticing that. And that's one thing that's funny too. I've, I've been 
able to let go of a lot of things as a for the shit the past six months have been crazy and it's really getting dialed in on on what i how i want to show up in the world and a way of being i mean my tribes and dan houston have been really helpful for that it's it's like the the, the, the idea of the word being has been really powerful for me because it's like if i say like who are you well then you're going to attach um your past and your projected future and uh, what you and what you do it's 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 a funny question because it, it does open up to a lot of not now and if you say like who are you being well that that has this sense of presentness to it that really does something for me and i think that asking myself like who am i being and how am i being seen um really has changed the way that i pick up sandals at whole foods whenever i drop them off the, or knock them off the rack yeah right? it's like yeah. oh no do i want to who do i want to be right now do I want to be the guy who walked? Do I want to be the guy who walked off with the sandals, or do I want to fucking turn around for two seconds and put them back on the rack where they belong? This is gonna trip you out. I literally have this as a screensaver on my phone. It's who do I get to be? <laughs> there you go. It's, like, it's exactly what you're talking about yeah. because because like, first of all, I just want to acknowledge what you just said. Like just having that. Like who do I get to be? Isn't that what a five year old would ask? Yeah. Isn't that what like little Connor or little Josh or little whoever's listening? Like our little young man or young woman inside, they would wake up on a Tuesday and they'd be like, well, who do I get to be today? Yeah. Should I be the astronaut? Should I be the fireman? Should I be the ship captain? Should I be the yeah. CEO? Whatever. It's this, it's this lack of exploration. It's this lack of fire of curiosity that kills people, man. Yeah. And that question, like, who do I get to be? That's not on my phone as a random ass platitude. It's on my phone because, like, that's a true reminder. Like, okay, can I take a breath right now and just ask myself, like, who do I get to be right now? <laughs> you know, not who, not who should I be or who am I becoming. It's yeah. more like in this very moment, who do I get to be? And, and it's this imperfect, constant reimprinting of our nervous system. That's where the real work is, man. That's yeah. where my work's at right now. Yeah, I feel you. Everything do. that I'm exploring in physical and emotional with wellness force, it's who do I get to be right now and how can I train my nervous system to be that person, to actually energetically be that person. <laughs> and, and that's the non-sexy work that you can't fucking download on a PDF from yeah. how do I become better.com. It just doesn't... Become... <laughs> Somebody out there is like, God damn it, they just put me on blast. Motherfucker, <laughs> he just totally dissed my site. <laughs> well, dude, speaking of wellness for us, where can everybody find you at, man? This has been a really fun conversation. I'm excited to get this oh, out Oh, shit, there. yeah, we've been going for a while. Yeah. Um, wellnessforce.com is the website. Wellness Force is the podcast. Listen to Connor and I on the podcast. That was actually really cool recording with you at the house. It's fun, man. Um, man. But yeah, like if I said something that triggered you, like honestly, just reach out to me. It's at Wellness Force all over social. And also, too, if I said something you're curious about, like explore some of these deeper conversations we've had. Because, man, there have been some incredible human beings that you and I respect yeah. that I've got to sit down and have hour-long conversations with yeah. uh, because I wanted to just figure out, oh, well, how do I actually be that as well? Yeah, man. You, you, we, it's funny. We have we have really uh, similar missions, but our, our podcast styles are very different. And totally I like different. that. You, you asked really good questions. I had a, had a great time uh, doing, the, doing the Wellness Force podcast with you the other day. And yeah. was some of those questions like peeled back the layers and i really dug it so man i appreciate you having me on the show and i appreciate Thanks, you man. coming on my show man yeah this was fun all right let's get uh let's this, get to get to the day this is my first time recording a podcast in a coffee shop like this too it's a magical experience shout out cosmic for having us for shout out cosmic us and, and, and uh bringing the good vibes hell yeah thanks connor all right man later that is our show everybody holy shit what an what an episode, man! Josh really showed up, super vulnerable, and he's got a really great show of his own at Wellness Force. Go check him out, and if you check out his show, you know, you know, you got to leave him a little review, five stars, some kind words, hit him with a follow on the social medias, and let him know if you like the show. Let him know that say, hey, I heard you on the realness, and it was lit. That's all you got to say is slide in his DMs. Let him know what's going on. Guys, if you want to get involved in the conversation, you can go to The Realness Community on Facebook. Request access. I'm talking weekly Facebook Lives, Q&As. Some of the guests of the show jump in, and we, we just explore whatever the fuck you guys want us to explore. Y'all are the boss in that community. I'm just kind of there. It's your world. I'm just living in it. And also, I've got to let all of you know that The Realness Retreat is going down outside of Austin, Texas, August 10th, with friend of the show and friend of my heart, Kirsten Asher. Three days, or two and a half days, so Friday to Sunday, dancing, exploring, moving, sharing, opening up, and creating an amazing environment for authentic expression that will just, it'll, we'll break some patterns. We'll get in the sunshine. We've got, uh, Potentially got a movement expert coming out to, to help us flow it out 
and maybe, perhaps, maybe, I don't know, dropping hints, a sound healing as well. Guys, this is going to be an accumulation of some of my favorite people, some of my favorite experiences for all of you. The cap is at 12 right now. At most, at most, we'll have 20 people at that retreat. So do not delay. Get over to getTheRealness.com and fill out a short little form. It'll get you on the list. It'll get you in the in the group message, and we can get everything coordinated as well. I am so fucking stoked to make that retreat happen, guys. It's going to be beautiful. West Austin, if you have not seen that, it, the hill country out there is just amazing. Good vibes all around. And of course, if you love the show, go to iTunes, give it a five-star review, leave some kind words, let me know what's up, let me know you love it, and we will see y'all next time. Thanks for hanging out to the very end. As always, for those of you that go all the way to the end, you get some special love, some special good vibes. I'm giving you a podcast hug right now. Feel it. Close your eyes. Feel the tingles of my of my strong arms embracing you via this podcast. You're amazing. We'll see y'all next time. Peace.